Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, today there continues to be amazing advances in technology. And one broad area I really find fascinating is that of human-computer interaction, and especially in advances in augmented reality and virtual reality. We're joining me in a conversation is Dr. Douglas Bowman. He's the Frank J. Marr Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Center for Human-Computer Interaction at Virginia Tech. And thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Bob. I appreciate it. Well, you know, so uh, there's a lot of initials. There's a lot of different terms out there. It seems like the three that perhaps we could start, if you could help us with the definition and perhaps provide an example so we can distinguish among the three. But how would you technically define starting with the notion of virtual reality? Right. So virtual reality, or VR, is the concept of replacing your reality with a computer-generated environment. So the idea is that you can, uh, you can generate an environment that might be uh, the surface of Mars, for example, or the Roman Colosseum, and then using VR technology, allow the user to virtually travel there uh, to experience that environment as if it was the environment they were, they were actually in. Augmented reality, the counterpoint to that, AR, is the idea of enhancing the real world. So in this conversation that we're having right now, if I was using augmented reality technology, maybe I would put some notes like hanging above your shoulder there so that I could refer to them as we were conversing. Uh, or maybe I would have some information about you that I could refer to. So it's, in, it's uh, augmenting the real world. So we hear a lot about artificial intelligence and it seems like are they blending together or is that kind of an umbrella term, a little bit more specialized than the other two? I would say artificial intelligence or, or AI is a kind of a sister discipline to AR and VR. AI really refers to any, uh, any situation in which the computer or the machine can exhibit behaviors or characteristics that are similar to what humans can do. So uh, autonomous cars of the future are going to rely on AI, but not necessarily AR or VR. They, they do have an interesting kind of combination, however, um, if I can have augmented reality or virtual reality that includes some artificial intelligence, then that system can be smarter. So it might know, for example, what notes to pull up when I'm in a conversation with someone. Um, how would you characterize um, kind of where we are with each of those? And we can start with um, the augmented reality. Where are we now? Because I'm assuming there's a lag between the research and capabilities than quote the marketplace. And so each of those where are we in terms of advancement at this point, capacity-wise? It's a good question. I mean, these, these technologies are really kind of just entering the, the public consciousness or the consumer realm. Um, they've still got a ways to go, actually, but they've been around for more than 50 years at this point. Wow. So both technologies were kind of invented simultaneously uh, in the late 1960s. Um, and it's taken you know, 50 years to get to the point where we are now. Right now we have uh, consumer products in the VR realm. In the AR realm, there's still a little bit more on the research side. There's still a little bit of development to do before they're consumer ready. But I actually brought uh, some headsets here that we could look at if you want to sure, do please. that. Thank you. This is an example of a VR headset. This is um, the Oculus Quest, or I guess now it's the Meta Quest since uh, Facebook changed their name. Um, so this is a, a, something you can buy at, at Best Buy. Oh. Um, and it's, it's simply a, a pair of displays with some optics inside that goes on your head. And there's a technology that tracks the head movement. And that's what allows people to be immersed in a virtual environment. So the computer can generate pictures of the environment. Um, and you can, uh, when, when, the, when the user's head is tracked, those natural movements allow them to view different parts of the environment. So you get that sense of presence. You feel as if you're in that environment that's, that's being depicted. So that's VR. And then on the AR side, um, this is uh, an example of a current headset. This is the Microsoft HoloLens 2. Um, it's available for purchase, but it's mostly in use by enterprise uh, and military uh, and some other, uh, some other domains like that these days. The difference that you can see here is that you can see through the lenses. So that's what makes it augmented reality. Um, if you, when you wear this, you can see directly through the lenses to the real world. Uh, but then 
there's, uh, there's a display that allows you to overlay graphics on top of the real world. And again, just like the VR headset, there's tracking in here so that as you move, those virtual objects can remain fixed in the real world and appear to be actually there. Well, not to confuse things a little bit, but there was one show that I was um, fascinated about last year in the season, and it was where people have a different personality, um, a presence they wanted to show. So the audience was looking at, they were behind stage, but it was projected such that they could see it. So where does that come from? No, was it almost like it was their own persona, and they would be, have stuff all over them. So it's not that they were seeing, but in the audience you were seeing, almost like a hologram, but it looked more real than that. Is that a combination of, of the two or in terms of technologies? Yeah, I, th I think what you're referring to is what we would call an avatar. Um, so an avatar is a representation of a person. It can be a representation of myself, um, the way that I want to depict myself to someone else inside a virtual world. And so since it's all computer generated, you can do whatever you want with your avatar, right? You can dress it however you want. It, can, you know, it doesn't even have to be human, right? <laughs> right. It could be a, a creature of some sort. Um, and that's, that's what's interesting, but, but also you know, a, a little bit frightening in some cases about, uh, about being in a virtual world is that you're never quite sure who you're talking to um, or who they really are. Well, when we talk about the AR, there seems to be, in terms of industry now, there are absolutely apps you can get. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be a, a, a trend. And what would some of those uses, would it be limited primarily to entertainment? Uh, and we're seeing the more popularity growth in apps? So with both VR and AR, there are starting to be app stores where you can download lots of different experiences. and. You're, you're right, the, the first experiences are almost all games and entertainment oriented. Um, that's, where the, that's where the money is coming from, that's what is a, is a good experience currently with these technologies and people are willing to pay for. But there's so many other like, serious uses of these technologies um, that, are, that have been researched for many years and, and that are starting to become more available in real products. So, I mentioned military use of the HoloLens, for example. Um, so military training is a huge potential application of both AR and VR. Uh, we want to be able to train military personnel in exactly the way that they're going to, uh, to do their duties while they're on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't replicate that easily in, in real situations, even with, with uh, you know, war games and exercises and that sort of thing. So, we have the ability to computer generate opposing forces or, uh, or vehicles or munitions or other situations. Even uh, conversations with civilians, for example, is, is something that the military has trained on using these technologies. So that's, that's one example. But there's applications all over in, uh, in healthcare and medicine, in psychiatry, in architecture and design, art. Um, uh, construction, it, you name it, uh, almost every domain could potentially make use of these technologies. I guess the interesting thing about medicine, and is this theoretical or could it really be? I know that surgeons could practice with some of the systems, but could it ever actually be that the physician is in Boston and here in Roanoke performing an operation and then the mechanics on this end. I mean, is that really just Hollywood fantasy or is that absolutely some sort of uh, future application? I think that's definitely a future application. Wow. So it's telemedicine, which we, which we already have to some extent, right? There's, there's medical consultations and such going on over video conference and so on. But we already have both ends of that technology, right? So we have the, the VR or the AR headset that the surgeon can wear to to put them into the surgical theater. And then we also have, on the other end, the robotic technology um, to have the surgeon's actions replicated on the other end um, so that that surgery can be taking place remotely. That's definitely coming. One of the big um, areas, I guess, um, is certainly education as well. And that can enhance both the learning um, and put you in places, as you say, in terms you're not restricted to time and just the, the, the lecture format. 
Um, but I guess in giving, in terms of the other things, is that a, a, a growing area or is it l less funded than some of the others? Well, I don't know about funding. Uh, there's, always, there's always a question of can we get enough funding? And the answer is almost always no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, virtual education, I think, is, I mean, it started uh, really becoming prominent with the pandemic, yeah. obviously, right? We had to think about ways to do remote education, hybrid education, when we hadn't had to do that before. Uh, and there's a lot of limitations to the way we're currently doing it. When you get on Zoom, uh, and you have some, you know, 10 people in a classroom and 10 other people who are scattered around on their own computers. It's not a great learning experience for the most part. If we can use immersive technologies like these to put every student into the same virtual environment, um, then we have lots of opportunities to not only make it as good as in-person, but potentially improve on in-person because we can bring in 3D, uh, 3D objects, 3D models at will into that classroom environment, for example, or we can bring in the remote expert from around the world and have him join the class as if he were there in person. There's, there's lots of opportunity in the educational space. You know, it'd be interesting that if you could walk the battlefields of Gettysburg and see there in certain high points and what have you, because I could see where that would, uh, could be a profound influence on someone rather than just seeing pictures or film or video. Uh, before we get to some of the societal benefits and try to kind of look at those, um, in terms of the technology, um, uh, one of the things I read, it, it said that actually China is much further ahead of that. Is that really true in terms of the research technology and, and implementation? Uh, there's certainly a lot of work going on in Asia and, and China in particular uh, on these technologies. Uh, I think it's really a, it's a worldwide research and development um, initiative that there's there's work going on all across obviously North America and in Europe and and across Asia uh, certainly the you know the Chinese universities and companies are interested in this technology as well um, but I don't I don't think there's a, a difference in terms of who's ahead or behind necessarily so from a 40,000 foot view what are some of the societal um, benefits in terms of um, this kind of technology and systems that are coming forward? Well, where to start? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, one thing that, that is maybe not so obvious about VR, uh, people tend to focus on some of the negative aspects of VR sometimes, and I think we'll probably talk about that. Uh, they say, for example, that it can be isolating, mm -hmm. right? So if I put on this, this VR headset, I, I can't see you, I, I can't experience the stuff that's in the real world, and that could be a that could be a negative thing, but the flip side of that is that VR might help me to focus, right? So if I have focused work that I need to do, uh, then being in this environment can take away those distractions uh, that are keeping me from being as productive as I might want to be. There are actually people who are computer programmers who are spending much of the day in VR for, for just that reason. They want to get in the flow uh, and, and be focused on their work for long periods of time. So that's, that's one example of a societal benefit, mm -hmm. I think. I, another example is, is really social connection. Again, it seems a little bit weird to say because maybe these technologies seem isolating. But because they can connect us to people anywhere around the world, uh, I don't have to travel somewhere in order to have uh, what feels like a real engagement with you. Right, and so um, there's many of the companies who are doing, who are working on this technology, are working on social applications for just that reason. Are there? Um, I mean, we see in these commercials and some of the things that are kind of funny, that you can put them on and you're doing, and you forget kind of where you are. And of course, it, America's funniest videos is where people, grandma, ends up knocking over the television and all of this kind of stuff. But in terms of that kind of power, could you know you? The living room is only so large and you're doing all this expensive stuff. And then the inner workings of the brain, is there this kind of interesting uh, impact in terms of the, of the brain, the way you think, how you can get lost? I mean, that, that, that really shows how real it can really feel like. Absolutely. I mean, we probably could take a couple hours and <laughs> talk about that or a couple of days, really. One thing to say is that that's why VR works, is because it can fool the brain to some extent. When I put on this headset and I see the surface of Mars, 
at a, at a high conscious level, I know I'm still sitting in this chair, I'm still in Roanoke, I'm not on the surface of Mars, but because what my eyes are seeing and what my body is feeling correspond exactly or close to what I would, would, would see and feel if I were actually there, the best explanation the brain can come up with is that I'm there. And so I react as if I'm there. I feel as if my, my whole body has been transported to that place. So there's definitely this, uh, this aspect of uh, brain uh, mind illusions uh, in, in AR and VR, but we can harness those for, for some really interesting effects and, and, and good effects. So one example of a study um, that I think is, is interesting is some researchers um, used VR to put people into the, into the body of a child. And so they were seeing <laughs> the world from a child's perspective, and when they looked down, they saw a child's body. And they actually uh, felt more connection to a parental figure in that study than, than they would uh, if they were in an adult body. So there's all sorts of, of interesting psychological experiments, but also um, psychologically beneficial illusions that we can create with immersive technology. Can you imagine putting it in, and, 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 and you're in a dog, but that's a different kind of thing <laughs> going down that. But, but it, right, this is what, interesting, I remember well when Dad brought home our first color television and turned that antenna post up there so we could get to CBS and for Bonanza. And we just thought, my gosh, that isn't that realistic? Well, of course, it was awful. Here, the blue spotches here and green didn't look like green. And, and then, of course, I remember not that long ago, HD. And all of a sudden, like, oh, my gosh, you can almost. So it just, it's interesting how we've had those kind of degrees. And now it's even that kind of wow factor is something that, uh, that kind of brings that home in some sort of comparisons. Right, and, and you wonder if <laughs> AR and VR are gonna to need to continue to get better and better and yeah. more realistic in order for, for people to keep believing them. I, I, when I did my very first VR demo uh, back in, this was in the mid 90s, um, it was very, it was awful by today's <laughs> standards, right? The, the 3D model was, was very rough. Uh, the, the headset was really heavy and bulky. The resolution of the display was, was terrible. The tracking was slow. And yet, it, so it was a virtual elevator. It took you up in a virtual glass elevator. And yet, I, I felt my knees shaking when the, when the elevator went up. So there's this visceral, physiological reaction. If I experienced that same demo today, would I still have that reaction? Or do we need to keep on ramping up the, the realism? That's an interesting research question, I think. Yeah. So uh, as a parent, um, should there be limits to the use of that. I mean, we, we already know what social media is doing, and some would argue that there needs to be limits on that, even age as it relates to cell phones and what have you. With this emerging technology, from a parental standpoint, any observation or advice there? Well, uh, I'm a parent, <laughs> so I have some direct experience with this. I mean, the, the first thing to say is that there are some physiological reasons why you might not want younger kids to use this for any extended period of time. So um, the eye is still developing, the visual system is still developing in kids up to age 12 or 14 or, or what have you. Um, and because what you see in VR is not exactly the same as what you see in, in the real world and there's some differences in visual cues, there's a suggestion that that could cause eye strain it certainly does cause eye strain, but it, maybe it, it causes uh, uh, impaired development of the visual system, potentially, if over long-term use. So I certainly wouldn't have younger kids using it for more than 20 or 30 minutes at a time. Um, in terms of some of the more like, psychological or addictive sorts of uh, possibilities, I, I think it's just like any technology mm. in that sense. Um, the fact that it's super realistic in some cases might make you uh, take a little bit more pause in that, especially if it's violent video games or, or what have you that are more realistic than, than when you see them on your Xbox or, or whatever. Um, so we should be cautious about that, I think, but I think just like any technology, you kind of limit the amount of use, uh, uh, you know, limit the screen time, as we say. So the, the notion of when you develop a technology there's the science, but the implementation is the individual as it relates to their own 
morals, cultural attitudes. So it's an instrument that can be used for good or bad. Um, and I guess that's kind of where we are. In your own personal kind of research, um, do you think about those kinds of issues in terms of the implementation and what have you? We do. So one of the one of the main thrusts in my lab right now is thinking about how augmented reality will be used in the future as kind of an everyday technology. So I've talked about a lot of kind of special purpose applications like military training and, and so on. But you can also use this augmented reality technology, for example, as a replacement for your smartphone. Right? So whereas now to know what the weather is, I need to dig in my pocket and turn on my phone and find the weather app and so on. In the future, maybe through my AR glasses, I'll just have a weather app that can pop up when I, when I want it. So, okay, so that's a, a nice vision, potentially, but is there gonna be too much information all the time? If it's, if it's in a pair of glasses that I'm wearing all day, every day, is that gonna be overwhelming? Is it gonna cause more stress and anxiety? So we worry about kind of develop, developing and designing these technologies in such a way that they're calm, that the information uh, is only present when it's needed, and then most of the time I'm not seeing any virtual information. I'm just seeing the real world. So we think about, about principles like that. Um, so um, it's certainly um, what I've read as it relates to uh, the millennials and Generation Z. Um, they're expecting um, this kind of technology even now from anything from shopping um, and, and, and exhibits and what have you. And so is this a generational kind of, um, of shift as we're seeing more and more in terms of the applications? Possibly, I mean, the VR and AR is not out there enough in the real world yet to know whether it's gonna become like a paradigm shift like the smartphone was. Mm -hmm. I personally think that it probably will be, especially augmented reality. Once we get to the point where augmented reality can be as small and light and unobtrusive as the eyeglasses that you're wearing right now, or, or even a pair of contact lenses, um, then we really can use it to do almost everything that we do today use, through our computers and smartphones and smartwatches and so on. So I think it, in my opinion, it will be a, a paradigm shift, but that's still several years down the road. Is there one unknown that needs to be solved to get to whatever the next level is in terms of this technology. Whether we're talking about bombs or the atom bomb or whatever certain things, it was like if we can solve this issue, mm. this is kind of what's holding us until we can solve that. In your particular world, what is that question? What are those challenges to get from where we are now to what you would think is even that next um, uh, level. What's the biggest challenge? Well, can I give you two answers? Yes, sir. <laughs> you please, said the please. biggest challenge, but I'm going to give you two. That mean, one is purely technical. So um, we've gotten to the point where we have very good high resolution displays. Um, those ca came really from smartphone research, uh, and that translated into, into VR and AR. But as you can see from this technology that's sitting here, it's still pretty big, it's pretty bulky. Um, there are computers in here which take up a lot of space and they use a lot of power and the batteries don't last very long. So miniaturization of all these components so that it does become as unobtrusive as a pair of eyeglasses or a pair of contact lenses, that's the, the technical challenge that has to be solved. And lots of smart people are working on that. But I'm, I gotta give you another one because yes. I'm not working on that. <laughs> um, the other challenge I think is the user experience. Mm -hmm. So even if we have the, the technology perfect, we have to know how to use the technology to display things and to allow interaction with content in ways that are gonna be usable and useful and satisfying to the user. And that's really what our research is about. It's about designing that future user experience so that when we do have the good hardware, then we're ready to, uh, to use it in ways that people will enjoy. You know, I, I have to make a, a small confession. I, I have a pretty smart car. And they say it'll park itself. I have not in two years let it park itself at all. I don't trust it one bit. And so I do understand perhaps that kind of challenge. Well, this has been, we could continue. There's so much, but we're unfortunately out of time. That's all the time we do have for now. But I want to thank my special guest, Dr. Doug Bowman. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with me, Bob Denton.